My name's Chris Hewitt. I've been a journalist for uh, 50, nearly 50 years. And uh, uh, my background is I started off on lo local papers. Then I specialised in uh, IT and business stories. And um, I've known about Jimmy Savile. Uh, there were rumours about him in the 1960s. I had the story firmed up on him in 1978. And, uh, tell us what you mean by firmed up. Um, I mean, I, we used to call it, you get, can you stand a story up? There's, there's such yeah, a sure, yeah. rumours yeah. rumors going around the whole time. But we as yeah. journalists, what we try and do is try and, you know, stand those stories up or firm them up before they get near to getting into print. Yeah, well, that's what I mean. I mean, I, I mean the story stood up. I had uh, people in the... Uh, music business, including Pete Waterman, confirmed the uh, stories about okay, Savile. Well, can you just take us from the rumours to actually getting it all firmed up? Right. Well, w when I was a student, started off at the local tech in the, um, 1969. Uh, obviously, you, you know, we in Coventry. I was in Coventry Technical College. Yeah, in 1969, we we, we looked at uh, booking. Uh, uh, DJs for you know the May Ball and things like that, and uh, somebody suggested Savile, and uh, uh, you know contacts in the music business said don't touch him. They said uh, they want to know how old the girls were, were who started the tech, and I said they're 16. And this contact of mine said he likes them younger than that. Right, so that's a rumour. Yeah, and certainly when uh, certainly when I went to uni, there were similar rumours going around then, and. Um, I met journalists over the years who, who tried to expose Savile, but again, nobody was interested. Um, I eventually I did manage to get Pete Waterman to firm it up, and that was in 1978. Okay, so what did he say? Oh, he he, he confirmed that Savile was uh, a paedophile. Right, amazing. So at that point, you're starting to think, well, these rumours from college. Now I'm a journalist. Maybe we should get this out there. Yeah, it should do, yeah. And, uh, uh, you know, when I approached some of the nationals, they just were not interested. And, and then they started doing a bit more digging, and I found out that Savile had been arrested by on at least six occasions for offences against underage girls. Yeah. On, each, on each and every occasion, he'd been released on the orders of Special Branch. Oh, so do you know where he was arrested? When, roughly? No, but he said he's well. He said he, this this was prior to 1978. He'd been nicked at least uh, six times. Um, but uh, so, and where did you get that information from? Well, I, I have police contacts yeah. uh, because uh, the West Midlands uh, Fire Squad would like to have seen him locked up as well. Oh, okay. So, that, so there were elements within the police that were trying to, you know, back even back in the 70s, trying to prosecute him. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. So he'd be, I mean, how did it work? He'd be lifted by the police, people yeah. make accusations, yeah. and then just let go. Well, Special Branch specifically ordered him to be released. Can you explain who Special Branch are for people that don't understand? Well, the, the Special Branch was originally set up in Victorian times to keep an eye on the Republican side in Ireland, because they're, they're actually known as the Special Irish Branch. Uh, but now they're interested in uh, security issues. Mm. And, every and, force has every force has its special branch officers, doesn't it? They seem to get very much involved in things like political policing. I was interviewed. That's right. Yes. I was interviewed yeah. by uh, special branch officers when I had death threats from the Jewish Defence League, for example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so with the Vice Squad, because they knew he was uh, he couldn't keep his hands to himself. So, I mean, what, how does it work when, when somebody like the Vice Squad can't actually pursue prosecutions uh, yeah. for pedophilia? I mean, that sounds, I mean that's, that's their bread and butter, surely. That's right, absolutely right. Well, Special Branch ordered Savile's release on at least six occasions. Now, they would only, the, uh, the only reason I can think that why that would happen is because he was an intelligence asset. See, MI5 always has been long been paranoid about the BBC. That all these liberal program makers were taking Moscow gold and all this sort of nonsense. What you've done is you've you've put in my mind this whole idea of the idea of um, uh, uh, police infiltrators, police sources. You know the the uh, the people who are sent out to infiltrate gangs and things. Almost no. talking about Savile as somebody like that, who's who's uh, you know he's he's a he's a confidential source for the police. 
Well, I think it was more to do with the fact that he was a, a sorcerer MI5. Mm. Um, by, the way, by the way, in police infiltration is nowhere near as uh, common as uh, the conspiracy theorists say, because frankly, they don't have the officers. <laughs> you know? So how does that work with MI5? What's the implications of that? Because they're like military intelligence, aren't they? Uh, well, they don't gather a military. They're, they're, they they actually deal with security of the state. Um, but the MI5 have always had. To, well, I don't know about now, but certainly in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, they had a certain paranoia about people who worked for the BBC, and uh, the, the belief was that. Uh, uh, you know, the, the, the KGB had heavily, heavily infiltrated him. So what, are you suggesting that, that uh, he was a sort of a political informer for MI5 at the BBC? Yes, almost, yes. That's the only one, that's the only thing I could think of. You know, you know he was what was called an asset. Amazing, really. I mean, yeah. I, I mean, this relationship with Prince Charles, now King Charles, is a pretty weird one. Uh, I mean, the, the suggestion is that uh, Savile just completely conned Charles. Uh, or, I mean, it, you know, it, it does seem like it, that's a bit of a difficult thing to do, because Charles knew him for a very long time, and surely mm. would have been aware of all these rumours no. and these arrests, for example. No, if, uh, that's, only, that's only if the uh, special branch told him. Oh. Yeah, uh, but but Savile knew a lot of people because uh, he, he used the uh, the cover of his charity work. That's why he was able to get close to the good and the great. I mean, it's certainly true that he did raise a hell of a lot of money for charity. Yeah. Uh, okay. So uh, overall, uh, were you surprised when uh, Savile died that these things then began to trickle out? Because even the no. BBC after uh, Savile's death, I mean, obviously, you know, journalists understand that uh, unless it's gone through the courts, uh, it's very difficult to criticise these um, celebrities because they'll come for you in a libel case. That's right. Yes. Um, no, but I mean, I, I think a lot more journalists knew about it, but. It was actually down to, but there, there are a lot, quite a few Fleet Street editors who hate the BBC. Oh, for example, I was very surprised the Daily Mail hadn't run the story. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it, almost an obvious thing for them to do when they pick up yeah. something like that. Uh, yeah, and, and Murdoch also does a lot of the BBC. Um, uh, uh, again, I'm surprised the Murdoch papers have never didn't go for Savile. Well, Bill Oddie's uh, on the record as saying that um, the only reason Savile wasn't prosecuted is because Charles was protecting him. Charles was a character reference. Uh, well, Charles would only, be, would only be able to comment on his uh, work for charity. No, but he wasn't being protected by Charles. The Royal Family, isn't that, the Royal Family uh, uh, is a lot, uh, doesn't have anything like that amount of influence. They certainly couldn't influence uh, uh, decisions not to prosecute him. Uh, anyway, I mean, I think, you know, you've done a tremendous amount of work over the years. Yeah. Um, and, uh, Chris, with your, you know, you've also you know, been on this program talking about uh, the Birmingham pub bombings, etc. Yeah. And I was yeah. shocked to hear that there was some sort of Rule 24 complaint by another journalist against you through the Journalist Union. Can you just tell us about that whole process and what it was about, please? Well, one of the worst kept secrets in the West Midlands is that... Uh, Warwick University, or Warwick PLC as we all call it, uh, was, pro was giving priority to rich Chinese students over better qualified uh, British students. And uh, that, was deemed to, that was deemed to be racist when it would do, it was, it was a question of fact. Um, I mean, having said that... Who, who said it was racist? No, it was racist for me to say that. Well, four months after they tried to throw me out of the union, the Sunday Times ran the story on the front page. And the Sunday Times wouldn't run a story like that without triple checking it. Wondering, you know, who could construe a story like that as racist? So you're saying effectively that um, students from China, because they're paying more money, yeah. are being selected to go to Warwick rather than people who are equally or better qualified who are paying them less money. That seems to me like a simple question uh, uh, about the ethics of the running of the university. Well, yes, and. Uh, um Absolutely right, and uh, um, a lot of uh, uh, more and more universities are seeing Chinese students as a milch cow. Uh, and I think it's a, it's a very dangerous oversight. You see, one thing I can tell you about uh, overseas, a lot of overseas students, if they come from wealthy homes, their parents expect them to get to, to, to get a degree. That's why a lot of them don't do don't work as hard as they should do. Um, 
Cambridge is the only university to date that has said that overseas students who don't do the work will get will get chucked out. If they fail their exams, they'll be shown the door. Yeah, I mean, there's a temptation, isn't there, for these universities just simply to be looking at the bottom line rather than academic excellence. They've been looking at that for a very long time, I'm afraid. A lot, uh, Warwick was the first one to sell its soul, but uh, you find there's a lot more. Because uh, universities have overextended themselves um, financially. I mean, uh, I, I'd love to know how many universities are actually getting close to being in serious financial difficulties. Universities will go bankrupt. I mean, we, we, we've got about was it 145 universities when perhaps we only need 30. Yeah. Well, I mean, the idea is that uh, the, there's less jobs out there since the manufacturing has all collapsed. And That's right. Uh, so we've got to keep people in education for much longer, even if they're learning virtually nothing or they're learning nothing. Uh, well, well, well. One in four, uh, one in four graduates have never used their degrees. That's that's been the case for a hundred plus years. Uh, but no, the uh, the theory is that. Uh, that, that is, I've heard this one that they're being kept in because it uh, keeps them off the, the, the unemployment figures. But that is a very expensive way of doing it. Uh, if you want to keep, if you want to get young people into real jobs with real training, what we what we should have done, which Thatcher refused to do, was to bring our training laws into line with Germany, because I don't know when an apprenticeship contract is is very difficult to enforce legally. You know, they could they could make you spend your five years just making the tea. But uh, if, if, if we had German, if we had German style apprentices for five years, uh, industry would very quickly create half a million real, real jobs, not, uh, you know, not, not stacking supermarket shelves, and that would get a lot of people into real jobs, into real work. So they, so when they, uh, if they decided to move on to another employer, they got real experience on their CV. So can you just take us through this process? Because, I mean, you're one of the best journalists I know, Chris. You, you're very articulate. You've got a lot of experience. You've got integrity. In other words, you're prepared to push a story, even yeah. if it might not be popular with an editor. What happened? Uh, well, uh, somebody was, was uh, one of the persons felt in, uh, insulted about uh, I, what I was saying. So I apologise to her because... Uh, Unlike some of Fleet Street's finest, I don't have I don't have an ego problem with apologising, um, but uh, uh, they they accepted they accepted that uh, uh, I I'd apologised adequately and that the case was withdrawn. Um, but uh, I, I very nearly I was very close to resigning from the union because uh, that's not how you treat your your, your members who pay the fight for their for people's paying conditions. Um, it was only because I had some very good members in Coventry and Birmingham who persuaded me not to not to resign and carry on and uh, keep up the fight. I mean, but the thing is, you've apologised for something which you, I mean, you're saying I'm sorry it was racist, but it wasn't. No, no, I did say it was sorry. I said I was sorry that they felt upset by what I'd said. Oh, but I see. The, but the Sunday Times, about four months later, the Sunday Times ran the same ran the story on the front page. It's over five years ago, but I think it was along the lines that why it was uh, giving preference to rich Chinese students. Now we see, um, I see the reason why uh, we invite Chinese students over here goes right back to the 1960s. My late father was a project manager at Courtauld, and Courtauld used to do what was what we now call design and build, where they go where they go to a country and they'd offer the design. Build and procure, design, design uh, a man-made father's factory, procure all the equipment, supervise his building, get the, the, the workers trained up to do it. And um, w when he was in China, uh, Lan Chao, this was in the middle of the Cultural Revolution, he took a letter from Coventry's, uh, uh, from one of Coventry's senior Labour people, who was one of the founders of the party, called George Hoskinson. And he gave that to Chow En Lai, the Chinese Premier, inviting the uh, them to send uh, undergraduates to uh, Coventry Poly, Lanchester Polytechnic and Warwick University. And uh, Premier Cho said, we will, but this is not the right time. And this is where they're coming from. And uh, there are too many, there are far too many universities just seeing overseas students as milch cows. You know, it's, 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 you know, it's an easy few thousand quid they're going to get off them. But I mean, as soon as, you, soon, soon as British students had to start paying fees, that fundamentally changed uh, the attitude of most people towards uh, university education because 
I'm actually surprised that more undergraduates don't sue their universities for some of the rubbish courses that are being offered. Well, some of them have been, certainly during COVID, saying that the quality of education was appalling. Well, well, certainly at Warwick, uh, a lot of Warwick students were very angry that uh, they were having to rely on uh, um, uh, lectures which were, which were delivered over via their laptops. Um, because obviously if you're in the same room, it's perfectly possible to have a lecture as long as you observe the... Uh, uh, the isolation rules are six foot between each student, but uh, but but uh, you see, if you go in a room full of people, somebody might think of a question that you haven't thought of, and uh, it's easy. A lot of people do not like speaking over over uh, laptops or on TV, mm. um, but uh, they certainly got a lot of flack for that. And um, as I said the universities are going to go bankrupt, and that's why it's. Uh, it's, it's a it's, it's a false economy too. I don't know if you're aware of a story at Warwick University about 20 years ago, uh, with this senior philosophy lecturer Nick Land being b booted out. Uh, he was um, one of the senior uh, Nietzschean philosophy lecturer um, for feeding LSD to his students and trying to conjure demons. Do you, I don't know if you come across that one, Chris. Have you? No, uh, no, I didn't. Uh, partly, problem is that. Uh, People do not like criticising. There's too many editors who don't like criticising universities. I mean, it's like if you go back to the 60s and 70s, the editor of the Oxford Evening Mail refused to run stories critical of the university, unless it was a court case. Yeah. I mean, the, I mean, this is instantly the reason why the satirical magazine Private Eye was founded, because Richard Ingram and uh, his friends could see that there were stories the local paper ought to be covering, which never were. Well, we've certainly got the same in Bristol, Chris. Uh, yeah. There is a newspaper, thank God, The Anarchist uh, Bristolian, um, yeah. which does print those stories and, um, for example, does cartoons, which are very critical of the establishment in the city. And I think without it, a city, without a paper like that, a city really uh, it is almost like it doesn't have a heart. So a story that an editor will reject because it's critical of the establishment needs to find an outlet somewhere. Oh, I agree. I agree. Um, um, I was told this by a senior panorama journalist, uh, in about 1975, because I said I've got this story which I can't get published. He said, do you agree I've got a duty to go to papers that work for? He says, yes, I, yes, he says, yes, you have, and I would do exactly the same, even if I got flat from my own uh, management. You know, and, uh, uh, I mean, I think the danger with the, the other big danger with the big expansion of universities is these number of halls of residence, which is specially built for uh, journalists, and uh, you know, and some of them, they're openly advertised as luxury, luxury flats or luxury digs, and um, that means they're in these. They're going. There's a danger that they're going to be in the same position that big cities like Coventry and Bristol had, where they re re reliant on just one or two industries. Mm. Um, well, I mean, you've been a journalist for longer than me, uh, yeah. quite a lot longer, actually, Chris. Uh, can you just sum up in a nutshell the changes you've seen in the profession over the years? Um, if you're going back, uh, when I was first interested in journalism, which was in the uh, uh, late 50s, when I was in the uh, junior school, um, I think the difference was that most journalists came from working homes. Uh, that is always impossible for any journalist who come from blue collar background to get into journalism uh, because the uh, stimulators who think that you, you've had a good education if you've been to a private school, which is often not the case. Mm. So is it, and, uh, is it, and that's the worst one. That I think the other big problem is that mm. you've got the elimination of uh, competitive papers. I mean, most big cities used to have two evening newspapers. I mean, was it Bristol? Was it the Bristol Journal, wasn't it? Was, um... We had, yeah, we had the Evening World and the Evening Post. The Evening World was owned by Northcliffe. The Post was locally owned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I know. And it's that, uh, or, or, or even if even if you got a uh, even if you got a weekly paper that does isn't owned by the main um, publisher, it's, it's, it still picks up stories. I mean. Um, when I started out professionally, it was I was on the independently owned Coventry Journal, and um, we used to outscoop the Coventry Evening Telegraph and the Birmingham Post and Mail and BBC Midlands, and you know, almost every week, you know, with, with good stories. Because uh, see, the other thing is, a lot of people 
won't go to established publications. They don't think they're going to be taken seriously. No, that's right. Well, this is a self-censorship kind of thing, isn't it? It's what, it's what this thing called the Bristolian. And generally speaking, if you chuck an interesting story that's been spiked by the big guys their way, you'll find it in the next edition. Anyway, look, uh, Chris, uh, you, you're still a member of the NUJ, are you? Yes, yes, I've, I've always been a member of the NUJ. Um, in fact, I was supposed to have got my gold badge at the... Uh, at the um, 101st uh, delegate uh, annual conference, but uh, that that sort of got lost in the system somewhere. Oh, so you you haven't you haven't had it yet? No, I haven't. I I tackled the general secretary at the time. He said he just said he's any Jane Goblins, and, and the next year after year after that, and it just, I just gave up. Well, I don't think you should. I think you're entitled to it. Anyway, look, Chris Hewitt, lovely to speak to you again. Thanks very much for joining us. Thanks. Bye.